Bună ziua, bine v-am găsit! Este ora 13. Vă mulțumesc foarte mult că sunteți alături de noi. Vă invit să urmăriți astăzi o ediție specială 360 Medical, în care veți vedea un interviu în exclusivitate realizat cu o persoană foarte importantă pentru România în ceea ce privește sănătatea publică. Este vorba despre doamna doctor Caroline Clarinval, reprezentantul Organizației Mondiale a Sănătății în țara noastră și șef al biroului Organizației Mondiale a Sănătății din România, începând cu luna august a acestui an. Doamna doctor a condus până de curând biroul Organizației Mondiale a Sănătății din Kazahstan și a gestionat operațiunile de urgență pentru Organizația Mondială a Sănătății în Ucraina. Dar o să aflați mai multe detalii despre portofoliul doamnei doctor în cele ce urmează, pentru că este important să știm noi așa cine ne reprezintă țara la cel mai înalt for din lume în ceea ce privește sănătatea publică. Interviul pe care urmează să-l vedeți este realizat de medicul Nicolae Fotin, invitatul permanent al acestei emisiuni. Și o să vedeți pe parcursul acestei ore foarte multe lucruri și veți afla foarte multe lucruri importante și extrem de interesante în ceea ce privește sănătatea publică în general. Această discuție are loc în contextul în care aici, la 360 Medical, vorbim în această perioadă despre gripă și despre afecțiunile sezoniere și o să vedeți și poziția domniei sale cu privire la acest subiect cu privire la vaccinarea antigripală, dar și cu privire la vaccinarea împotriva infectării cu virusul SARS-CoV-2, un subiect foarte dezbătut în ultimii ani. De asemenea, o să afla și date despre pandemia de COVID și ce predicții au experții internaționali cu privire la ceea ce va urma din acest punct de vedere. Dar haideți să urmărim împreună interviul cu doamna doctor Carolin Clarnival, oferit în exclusivitate, vă spuneam, pentru 360medical.ro și B1 TV. We are very pleased today to have uh, with us here at uh, editorial headquarters 360 Medical Dr. Caroline Clarinval, who was appointed as WHO representative and WHO country office in uh, Romania since August this year. Thank you for coming, Dr. Clarinval, and uh, welcome to 360 Medical. Thank you very much for having me today. Before uh, uh, going further, I should add some words about the uh, professional background of uh, Caroline. Uh, prior to be appointed in uh, WHO uh, as representative uh, and head of the country office in Romania, uh, Caroline uh, has led the office, the country office in Kazakhstan and also managed the public health emergencies and operations uh, for WHO in Ukraine. While um, acting or um, uh, serving uh, with her experience in the International uh, Committee of the Red Cross, uh, she assisted populations affected by um, conflicts, uh, managing large, large, large scale of um, uh, operations in Africa, uh, Asia and Middle East. In her capacity as uh, WHO Regional Advisor, uh, Emergency Response and Operations, uh, Caroline supported um, more than 14 countries and territories across uh, the Middle East region, responding to the public health emergencies in countries such as uh, Iraq, Libya, Yemen, Somalia, so very difficult countries from this uh, perspective when we are talking about the public health. But it's not all. And also in the period when uh, Caroline worked in the Federal Office of Public Health uh, in Switzerland, uh, she was responsible for uh, the national strategy on rare diseases and uh, as uh, uh, and was a member state delegated uh, to WHO. I should uh, add that uh, Caroline holds a PhD in uh, biomedical uh, ethics and uh, law, 
master's degrees in uh, biomedical ethics and uh, human rights law. And also she teaches biomedical ethics and humanitarian ethics at uh, Massachusetts uh, Institute of Technolo Technology, MIT in Boston, at uh, uh, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, at King's College, and of course at the University of Zurich. So, uh, so many uh, professional achievements, uh, Caroline. Um, because you had to manage so difficult countries uh, mentioned before, uh, from the perspective of public health, um, could you share with us some experience from WHO activities? Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Fontaine. It's, um, thank you. When, when I listen to the narrative or what we call the thread, the red thread of, um, of our life as humanitarian aid workers, um, I always remember the people that we were actually supposed to help. Um, I started this career um, early on in my 20s. And um, I went to Africa first, and I loved it. It was this, when, when you get this bug, you know, there's different viruses. They're the ones that make you sick, and then there's the ones that just keep you going, that motivate you, and that in the end never really let you go off. So I started this career um, with the International Committee of Red Cross, looking after vulnerable populations affected by conflict. And um, I was very touched by the difficulties that they had to go through. But I was always strongly impressed by their resilience. And I understood that um, people can find ways to start their lives again, or either because they have lost everything they had, or because they fell very ill. And um, I've always been very um, touched exactly by those who all of a sudden they find the energy and the resilience to start new again. Obviously, this doesn't happen alone. There's a certain system that you require as a person in order to uh, cope with difficult challenges. Um, and one of those systems is a healthcare system, right? So I've always been impressed at the efforts that um, ministries of health, as well as healthcare workers, the doctors, the nurses, the midwives, but also the pharmacists, as well as the administrative support uh, that they make in order to allow patients to be treated. We sometimes take this for granted, and, um, and I think I'd like to just pause and take a moment and thank all of them for having um, provided all those services and for doing it over and over again. Coming back to the years with WHO and more particularly the last two years where I think all of us, we were a bit shaken by the uh, recent COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I think it, it's, it demonstrates very well how vulnerable we all are. It's a lesson of humility to mankind. Um, but it also shows us that when we have the right tools in place and when we have the right systems in place, we can actually find ways to cope with the most difficult circumstances. And um, so that's why I feel passionate about what I do. And I, um, I'm very glad to be now here in Romania, to have joined the WHO team here in Romania and to be closely working with the Romanian uh, government and the Ministry of Health. In talking about the systems, the health systems, yeah. you know these days uh, the public health authorities are uh, focused uh, on the um, uh, flu season, which is coming. Um, do you think as WHO representative, um, this season uh, uh, should be different? Uh, we should be particularly worried about influenza this season? So indeed, um, we have been worried for the last few years now. Um, we've just come out of a summer where people were outdoors. Um, infection numbers of COVID, without delving into that topic now, were fluctuating around the globe. 
Um, but now that we are going into the autumn and into the winter, where people's behaviors will change again, we will be forced to be more indoors. We are expecting an increase in number of uh, influenza cases as well as COVID cases. So therefore, yes, we are anticipating a resurgence of the influenza um, virus. And um, are, um, I don't know, any actions that WHO uh, can take or could take to help uh, health systems or countries to, to prepare for this uh, season? So I think one of the key lessons that we have learned over the last few years is that preparedness is the essence. Um, WHO's role is a normative role, essentially. Um, so based on the evidence that we gather, based on the knowledge that we have and the expertise, um, WHO provides the guidelines to the member states of the organization, and Romania being one of the member states, WHO obviously also engages with the Romanian authorities. And this is here where we are um, very um, happy to see that Romania has proactively already procured uh, about, I think, 1.5 million doses of influenza vaccine. They've done this ahead of time, so they are ready to be administered and um, um, people have access to those vaccines. I think what I would particularly like to underline is that in this case, um, vaccines will be made available to the uh, at-risk groups for free. And when we look at the at-risk groups, who are they? These are elderly people above the age of 65. These are pregnant women. Um, these are people with uh, chronic diseases, such as cardiovascular diseases, asthma, diabetes, etc. cetera. Um, and these are the children as well, as well as, um, first and foremost, the healthcare workers because obviously they are the ones that are the most exposed, as well as people who live in settings where uh, physical distancing is a bit more difficult. So um, I think those groups are where the um, action and the attention has to be put on, and this is exactly what the uh, Ministry of Health has done. And uh, so the vaccines are available for those groups for free. Others can, um, as far as I know, be, uh, can go into pharmacies and procure the vaccine themselves. And this is also strongly recommended. Um, but I think it's a good moment again to just take stock. Where are we? Um, so we come out of the summer, we are going into the autumn and the winter. We are exposing ourselves again to greater risks of disease. But then the question said, what can we do? Is there anything we can do to protect ourselves? And in this case, yes, the answer is clearly yes. So we can, um, again, put all the chances on our side in uh, um, getting vaccinated on time. That's true. And I think it's the first time when uh, Ministry of Health in Romania succeeded to make the flu vaccine available so in time. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's clear for everybody that in this season also we will have both illness, the flu and COVID-19. How will WHO um, advise countries to manage these both uh, conditions? So WHO's recommendation is to vaccinate for both, and we can do that at the same time. Um, I understand that um, there's a certain level of hesitancy, particularly now that we have been talking about getting vaccinated over and over again over the last few years. Um, I think it's um, obviously there is a guideline that is out there, and um, that guideline from WHO has been adopted by the Romanian Ministry of Health as well. So you can get vaccinated for flu and COVID. Um, and I think it's important that people actually are given the opportunity to do that. So what does that mean? That means that, as you said, the vaccines have to be procured, the supply chain has to be in place, they have to be made available in the healthcare facilities, People need to know where they can access those vaccines. The communication side of things needs to be in place. 
And here as well, the Ministry of Health and WHO are starting an information campaign um, as, of the, uh, as of next week. And um, so once all these elements are in place, then it is made easy for people to actually go and get vaccinated. But I think it's fundamental that um, WHO as well as Ministries of Health that we put all the tools at the disposal of the population so that for them access to healthcare services or in this case more specifically access to vaccines such as the flu vaccine is made easy. Beside the vaccination, do you think people could do anything else to protect them mm -hmm. from illness and I don't know from for complications? Yes, this is a, it's a very good question. Um, and I know I will be coming up with the, the answer that we have been providing over the last few years over and over again, but they're still valid. So I'd like to just reiterate the importance of, in certain situations when you're in a crowded place, wearing your masks. Um, hand washing, please keep doing it. Um, personally, I always carry my hand sanitizers. I always spray it on my son's hands as well. Um, I use every opportunity to just make sure that I don't have the germs on my hands because I keep touching my face. Um, I also try to still be in areas, for example, to where we can ventilate the space um, well, or um, obviously when we sneeze and we cough, we have to protect ourselves. So. Those measures are still valid also in the flu season, but um, I think we have all adjusted to them. So this is nothing new. And here it shows how quickly people actually can adjust to a new context. Even if sometimes we drop right, our preventative measures, which we all do, um, we are still at least that we have been sensitized enough over the last few years to know that this is what we ought to do. And here we come again to the whole issue of, can we put the chances on our side? How do we do that? We get vaccinated and we adopt the protective measures. Personally, I'm also still uh, uh, inclined of keeping a physical distance if I can, um, simply because I just don't want to fall sick, although I love to hug people. So it's always a bit this um, dilemma whereby how do I welcome someone warmly uh, at the same time, how do I protect myself or how do I protect the other? I'd like to just seize a moment if I can and to just remind ourselves that there's a certain group of people that still needs to be protected and it's the ones with chronic conditions or it's the elderly. And I think also now that we go again into the end of the year celebrations, uh, it's important that we remember that they are particularly vulnerable. Uh, at the same time, we all can play an active role in protecting them. I understand that the economies are flourishing, that the schools are open, that the universities are back on track, that the social activities are happening, and we all welcome this. At the same time, if we can remember those um, particular preventative measures and we can apply them um, in order to protect the vulnerable, I'd really like to recommend that. That's true. There are so, so simple measures mm. that could be taken by everyone uh, to, to protect mm. the vulnerable uh, person. Um, when do you think would be the better period for uh, get the vaccine uh, for uh, flu, for example? So the best period is now. Uh, the vaccines are available. Um, uh, I understand that people have to eventually make an appointment or, or go, uh, go to an institution to get the vaccine. But um, the recommendation is to get to be vaccinated before the peak of the season of infections. Because it takes a bit of time, about two weeks, for the body to develop all the um, antibodies in order to protect themselves from um, disease or from a severe cause of the disease. Again, um, flu vaccines um, might still result in people falling ill, but what we want to prevent is that they end up at the hospital or that they die. 
So flu vaccines have proven to be effective and efficient. And in that sense, um, at least they will protect from a severe cause of uh, the disease. And particularly the vulnerable groups, as I said before, the healthcare workers, the elderly, etc. Uh, we strongly recommend that they get vaccinated as soon as possible. As you for sure uh, know, Romania, as many other countries, uh, faces an uh, important hesitancy to vaccination, mm -hmm. to all uh, vaccines and also for the flu vaccine. It's a reality uh, in Europe, at least. Um, how do you think uh, um, the authorities in Romania, for example, could um, act, could um, uh, make uh, possible to increase the people's confidence in, uh, in uh, vaccines and in vaccinations because we uh, know as a public health uh, employee, let's say, uh, that uh, for uh, many years and in many situations, these products are the only tools that we have to, to prevent some uh, and not few, I would say many, infectious diseases. So the first thing is for the authorities to make sure that the vaccines are available. So access is key. Then a lot of it is about communication. Just to remind people that, look, the vaccine is here. We are hitting a, um, um, a season where the numbers of cases might rise. Please go and get vaccinated. So the whole communication around uh, the vaccination is essential. But then when it comes to building trust, um, that is not necessarily simple. And we saw that during the whole last few years that a lot of people um, have a lack of trust in um, institutions, irrespective of what they are. Um, here in this case, I think one of the best ways forward to build trust is to demonstrate and to underline that the government has put in everything in place in order to allow people to actually have access to the vaccine. Whether they then decide to get vaccinated or not is the individual's choice. And, um, and here as well, it is for the individual to decide. Um, just maybe as a personal anecdote, um, sometimes uh, when we come back from a mission, um, obviously we always go and see the doctors, we have our regular checkups, uh, me and the kids, and, um, and the first thing that they always look at is like, Caroline, where's your vaccination booklet or the ones of the kids? Is there anything uh, missing? Do we have to catch up or refresh a vaccine? And, most of the cases, there's always something that needs to get uh, get done. And um, so what I want to say here is that it's good to have your regular checkups with your physicians um, to discuss the vaccination schemes that you have had, to look at whether yes or no there is something missing, irrespective of now COVID or, um, or influenza. I think it's just a good habit to have. Um, and obviously the children are never happy when, <laughs> when it's time to vaccinate again. But um, I think they got used to it by now as well. And even for myself, I mean, there's moments where um, it's, I need to be reminded as well. And I just look at my little booklet. I'm like, okay, what is coming up next? And I just go and get my vaccine done um, at the healthcare facility of my choice. But you take it. You yes, get the vaccine yes, I do. I, I'm a fervent uh, defender of vaccines. Again, maybe it comes to the, it boils down to the fact that I've seen so many countries and so many populations affected um, by difficult circumstances where they simply couldn't go and see a doctor. They couldn't go to the hospital. They were confronted, confronted with diseases that could be prevented by vaccines. They suffered because of a lack of a vaccine. And when I saw this, obviously I was like, I felt very privileged that as a, as a person, I would be able to go to return to a healthcare system where those vaccines would be made available or that I could go to a city where the vaccines would be made available. So I think it's, I got sensitized um, by this because of 
my my professional career path, and the um, and the um, how can I say the hardships I've witnessed um, personally, and and so I, I feel extremely privileged to have the ability um, at least to protect the kids and myself uh, with what I have at hand, um, and I do. Um, recommend that people that we are in an environment. I'm really, really happy to be here in Romania. We are in a situation in a country where many of those uh, preventative measures can be adopted, and uh, please, people, make the best use of it. Do you think um, the flu vaccines, for example, I will take because we are in the um, uh, season almost, are enough effective and safe? to prevent uh, the illness? So the flu vaccine is a vaccine that exists since, I think, about 60 years. Um, so it's a vaccine that has been tested a number of times. Um, it is regularly updated every year. They look at the strains of uh, the viruses and they adjust the vaccines accordingly. So I think um, at the level of the flu, um, also of the flu vaccine, also the national regulatory authorities who play a very, very important role um, for in every country, they are um, capable and able to um, certify the uh, safety and the efficacy of that vaccine. And here I think it's really important that we underline both. A vaccine has to be safe and it has to be efficacious. And, um, and here for the flu vaccine, there is a long history of knowledge and evidence that we already have gathered over decades now. Um, we also know that there's very a limited amount of adverse events, and if they are, those are being monitored. I think it's also important that um, there is a system in place that monitors if there is an adverse event. Um, and this is the case here in Romania. So I think it's good to trust the national authorities um, that when they uh, um, allow for a vaccine to be on the market, that we know that this is a safe and an efficacious vaccine and um, it's uh, fine for the population to go and get vaccinated. But what do you think uh, if there are some people who wants to to make uh, both vaccine for COVID and mm. for uh, influenza uh, this uh, period. How could they manage this uh, administration process? They should do it uh, in the same time. What What is your opinion? So I think that? it comes back to um, what works best for a person. Um, provided that both vaccines are made available, Either the person decides to go and get both at the same time. We have seen that WHO has issued guidance um, um, s stating that this is absolutely fine to do both at the same time. But then people might decide to take one or the other um, first and then they can come back. Um, obviously, when both are available, more particularly for the vulnerable groups, um, it's, it's good to take them um, uh, at the same time, because we have them there, right? We've got the people there at the health facility in order to get vaccinated. So it is a, a better, uh, most effective or most efficient way of administering uh, vaccines. But at the same time, I think it's important that people make that decision for themselves and in discussion with their healthcare provider, um, in consultation with their healthcare provider. And, uh, and that they decide to get, um, uh, get that vaccine or both vaccines administered. And what I find interesting in this case is that WHO has issued the guidance that it is absolutely possible for people to get both at the same time. Uh, do you have, or WHO has, some key messages going back to, to our main topic today? Mm -hmm. Yeah, allow me just to reiterate um, the key preventative measures that we can take. So first is get vaccinated um, if you can. Uh, more importantly, if you're part of the at-risk groups, please get vaccinated. If you're a healthcare worker, get vaccinated. If you're a person working in a crowded setting, get vaccinated. If you're an elderly person, please get vaccinated. If you're pregnant, etc. Um, if you have a disease uh, that um, um, would require or would protect, 
would require additional protection for you to just um, be as healthy as you can be. Please get vaccinated. Um, same for the kids. Um, because the more we get vaccinated or the, the higher the vaccination coverage, um, the more protected we will be overall and the less we will transmit um, diseases or at least the less we will be a burden on a healthcare system that is already stretched uh, in many, many countries. Um, so because we are at lesser risk of a severe form of the disease. So again, let's put those chances on our side. Um, maintain, wear our masks when we can, when we, well, particularly when we are ill. Um, adopt hand hygiene practices, maintain them, keep doing it, keep your physical distance if, if you can. Um, and, uh, and yes, so I think it's just to reiterate that we have a number of tools at our hands. It's our decision to use them. Um, and I think if we all adopt those best practices, we will have a smooth winter and then see you next summer. <laughs> Hope to see you soon again in our editorial headquarters, sharing with us some results of the priorities of WHO. And uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the time. Acesta a fost interviul cu doamna dr. Carolin Clarinval, reprezentantul Organizației Mondiale a Sănătății în țara noastră și șef al Biroului Organizației Mondiale a Sănătății din România. Am văzut poziția autorităților internaționale cu privire la mai multe probleme de sănătate publică și cel mai important, poziția Organizației Mondiale a Sănătății cu privire la gripă, la vaccinarea antigripală și la pandemia de COVID-19. Interviul de astăzi a făcut parte dintr-o serie de emisiuni 360 medical pe care le dedicăm gripei, mai ales că ne aflăm în plină campanie de vaccinare împotriva virusului gripal și fiecare dintre noi, nu așa, trebuie să fie foarte bine documentat cu privire la beneficiile pe care le aduce acest demers al vaccinării. Tocmai pentru a putea lua decizia cea mai corectă în ceea ce privește imunizarea, mai ales în cazul categoriilor vulnerabile de pacienți. Săptămâna viitoare o să avem în platou alte două cadre medicale și o să abordăm în continuare acest subiect care face referire la afecțiunile sezoniere și la gripă. Atât pentru astăzi. Aceasta a fost emisiunea 360 Medical. Eu sunt Aneta Sângiorzan și vă mulțumesc foarte mult că ne-ați urmărit. De la ora 14, colega mea Andreea Moraru vă așteaptă la o nouă dezbatere. Urmează așadar, tot pe un. Numai bine!